Hello, I'm Sarah Barth, Executive Director of Semper Virens Fund. Welcome to our latest uh, webinar series in the Under the Redwoods webinar uh, series to explore the beauty, history, science, and benefits of redwood forests. Semper Virens Fund acknowledges that the redwood forests in the Santa Cruz Mountains, within which we do our conservation work, were among the ancestral homes of many indigenous people, people who cared for these lands for millennia until they were forcibly removed. Um, we are really grateful to work today with some of their descendants, including the Amamutsun Tribal Band and the Mwekma Ohlone Tribe, helping to restore their cultural and traditional connections to these magnificent landscapes. Thank you to our sponsors of the Under the Redwoods webinar series, Sharf Investments, and this particular installment has been sponsored by Wilson, Sonsini, Goodrich, and Rosati. So thank you to our generous supporters for helping this webinar series to, to exist. Um, many of you have joined us for prior webinars, so you're familiar with the drill, but for those of you who are new, um, please note that we will try to take as many questions as possible and try to answer them at the end of the session or sometimes with follow-up messages. So put your questions into the chat or the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Also a reminder that this webinar is being recorded and will be um, web recast on our website for others to see if you wish to share it with others or, or watch it over and over again yourself. Before we uh, get into uh, our, the true heart of our webinar, I want to start by thanking uh, those of you, and there were thousands, who participated recently with us on Earth Day in our Hug a Tree Challenge. Earth Day, as many of you probably know, is a moment to um, well, just think about the Earth, uh, take action in some cases, to try to affect change. Uh, on behalf of the environment and also to, to celebrate nature. And this year, Semper Virens tried something new. We encouraged all of you who love trees to join us in taking a picture of your favorite, of you hugging your favorite tree, post it on Instagram, and um, in so doing, uh, break a, a, a world record, Guinness Book world record of the most number of trees being hugged in a single hour. And we were successful, thanks to all of you and others who participated. Um, so that was just a lot of fun. And uh, just want to acknowledge that if you want to learn more about it or see some of the images, you can go to our website, sempervirens.org, or check us out on Instagram. Thanks to the sponsors of that event, which were All Trails and REI, longtime generous supporters of Semper Virens Fund. Um, so thank you to them for making that. Um, fun celebratory event happen. Uh, finally, um, before we move on to our speaker, which is what you're all waiting for, we have a new and exciting project that Semper Virens will be rolling out later this year. You can get a preview of it um, in early May, May 8th, NBC's uh, Open Roads program uh, on the Bay Area, local Bay Area channels, a television program, will be highlighting this project. And it... Um, it involves protection of some spectacular old growth redwoods, as well as supporting efforts to help kids get outdoors and experience those redwoods. So it's a great project. Uh, check it out on May 8th on Bay Area's Open Roads Program, um, or just stay tuned to our various other communications modes when we'll let you know what's happening with this project. All right, getting to the heart of the matter for this webinar, one of the reasons it's this work is so important is not only the trees we work to protect, but the many species they benefit, whether it's, you know, species that occupy the coastal redwood fog belt in our landscape in the Santa Cruz Mountains, or all the other myriad uh, landscapes that are also part of this region, coastal prairies, chaparral, uh, sand hill, this area, this region is filled with unique eco niches, and each of them is accompanied by a set of bird species that occupy them, um, many of which are endemic, local only to this region, some of which are here seasonally. We just have a really, really rich network of birds occupying our region. And you might have noticed that more and more people are taking up birding. 
Um, and you may be one of them if you haven't, or if you haven't tried it before, maybe this webinar will inspire you. All of those are the reasons that I'm really delighted that we are joined today by Alvaro Jaramillo. He is a birding expert. He travels internationally leading bird, birding trips for those of you who might be interested, um, but he happens to be based in our region in Half Moon Bay. And he's here today to share with us his insights and information about some of the remarkable birds of our region. So welcome Alvaro. Hello. Hi. How are you? Good. Well, I'm ready to go, whatever you want me to hear. We're ready for you. All right. Let's do it here. Um, okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Thanks for joining us today and to learn a bit about birds on the Central Coast. And in particular, you know, also some of the birds of the redwoods. And um, I wanted to also uh, pull this talk back to kind of how you get into this and how uh, to do it, how to start watching birds and um, also one of the, some of the benefits that you get from just paying attention to birds into your daily sort of life. Um, so we can start with this. So we have beautiful areas here, natural areas on, uh, you know, in our Bay Area and in particular the, the forests on the uh, in Santa Cruz Mountains. And we enjoy going out there. We enjoy walking through these forests. But sometimes, you know, um, I think that we don't realize the, the, the benefits that we're actually getting from being out there are huge. And probably some of the other uh, webinars have been talking about this. And um, I, I want to repeat that there, these, there's amazing benefits to being out there and they're being studied. So one of the uh, people who's doing this work uh, right here in, in uh, Stanford University, Gregory Bratman has been having people go out and to nature and go out into urban areas. And they're testing the people's chemistry, body chemistry before and after they go and do these things. And what he's finding is when you go out into nature, you come back to be tested. All of that, uh, your body chemistry that is associated with depression, broodiness, rumination, you know, the sort of things that are going through your head that you can't get out of, are lower if you're going out into nature. So, okay, you know, we, we want to be out there looking at nature and looking at things and, and, and getting these benefits. And what's interesting too is that part of what's going on is that when we're out in natural environments, our brain loves to look at fractal patterns. And this is part of what gets you calm is looking at fractals. But this is a fractal. You know, this is, these are these um, bits, you know, where you kind of look at the tree and the branch looks more like, like another tree. And you look at that little branch, it looks like another tree, coastlines. A lot of natural things are fractal patterns, but this unnatural fractal does not do anything to calm you or make you feel better. This does. The real deal has to be what you look look at, and um, to to be able to get that calming uh, factor of being out there. And so I always say, you know, we want to get out there. That um, that nature is is something that's important to us and vital. Um, and birds, to me, are like the gateway drug to nature. They're the one that kind of can pull a lot of people out into the outdoors and to be able to sort of get the net benefits of this. And why, why birds? Well, they're everywhere. Birds are all over the place, in your backyard, in, in completely um, urban environments, as well as completely natural environments, mi middle of the ocean, in Antarctica, there's birds everywhere. They're also, a lot of them are really attractive to look at. They sing, they fly. It's basically all of our, you know, ways that we sort of encounter the world that birds are filling a little part of it in terms of uh, the way that we interact with, with the world. So this is a Townsend Swirbler from my backyard. This is a peregrine falcon that flew by just the other day at Pillar Point Harbor, almost hugging the, the sand, trying to catch a little shorebird that was out there. Beautiful bird in terms of its shape, the way that it flies. So some of it's about color, some of it's about form, some of it's about movement. Um, a backyard American goldfinch, and this is a male in summer, and in winter they look a little different. So there's change, there's 
something about birds that is sort of always con constantly changing enough that it attracts your attention and nothing in, in birding when you're out there seems to be the same. You can go to the same place an hour later and the birds will be different, things will be different. So um, there's an element of novelty that comes with paying attention to birds. To me, I think that birding is also perhaps the most portable hobby uh, you can do, you know, of, of any hobby. Like you can, you know, be a chess player, you can be a golfer, you can do all sorts of things with your time, even a hiker, but you can't do that everywhere. You can't hike in the middle of Antarctica on, on a glacier, but you can be watching birds there. You can be watching birds on Rapa Nui, the most isolated island in the world. Um, you can be watching birds anywhere, even, you know, out your backyard office window, even going, you know, walking your dog, you can be watching birds. It's sort of all there all the time. And I like to liken it like a good hot sauce that it improves the meal, but doesn't take away from it. You can be doing all sorts of things, hiking, golfing, eating at the end of the day, and, and add birding to that somewhere along the line. So it's not, a, it, you know, that it has to replace anything else that you do, but it adds a lot of, um, to what you already are doing. And it allows you sort of to pay attention in a different way. So you might be hiking the woods, but when you're hiking and looking for birds, you're thinking in a different way that sometimes focuses you more on what you're seeing, what you're encountering in a way that I find is almost, um, really like meditation, that you can think of it in that way. And there's points in time where it's you, the bird, and thinking about each other in a sense that is, is really just um, a very deep way to encounter um, nature. For me, it also has led to some crazy experiences as a bird watcher going around all over the world, seeing volcanoes erupt, lava flows, great white shark attacks. I've even been able to, in, in, in my wanderings, discover a brand new species of bird in the world, which was this, this little guy, oops, sorry, that was down here, called the Pinkoya storm petrel down in Chile. And uh, it was a brand new species of science that we had to describe. So how do you start? How do you do this? And um, I always love this quote that I don't know if it's actually real or not that that, you know, Yogi Berra famously said, you can observe a lot by just watching. And that's a, as simple as it has to be in terms of watching birds. You just look at them. That's it. Go you know, outside, backyard. You look at a bird and you think about it. You might contemplate what it looks like, its coloration, its song. You may not even necessarily need to know what it's called. But the moment that you do know what it's called, you have the name, you've identified that bird, then you can put it into a greater context of what it does, where it moves to, who it's related to, what habitat it likes, and it becomes a lot more fun. So I do think that, you know, finding out what a bird is, is the next step to, to uh, you know, really enjoying these, bir these birds and enjoying nature. Um, and uh, I published a a simple field guide to the birds of California with Brian Small. There are apps, there are all sorts of other um, more, you know, intense books on identifying birds. But um, the simplest thing is that you can just start watching. You don't need binoculars even at the start. Eventually you might want them. You want to begin with the simplest things that are out there. Perhaps it's your backyard to just look at the, the comings and goings of different species and try to sort of sort them out into um, you know, what they look like, what they sound like. And I, I do want to mention the, when you are starting, so this is um, a chestnut back chickadee over here. This is a bush tit over here. These are two little birds that come to backyards all over the Bay Area. We often, um, and especially the field guides, will talk to you about looking for patterns and coloration. So they might say the, the chickadee has a white cheek, it might talk to you about its, you know, chestnut back, the bush tit being kind of grayish brown. But to me, also there's aspects of shape and what birds make you think about or feel as you watch them. So to me, this little chickadee has this really, really big head, little tiny bill, and it just looks kind of adorable. It looks almost like the perfect little bird that you could make into a, a kid's toy, right? The uh, bush tit, 
has this little kind of yellowish eye that gives it such an intense stare. It looks almost aggressive. So it's a little tiny bird, just a little bit bigger than a hummingbird with this sometimes aggressive look to its face that you will never see in a chickadee. Both are small, but thinking about what the bird makes you feel, its shape, its um, size, its sort of look can be as helpful as the actual patterns on the bird in terms of identifying them. Um, I, I remember having a friend who's not a bird, bird watcher say to me, what's that black bird with the red on the wings? And I said, it's called a red winged blackbird. And he said, no, really, what's it called? I said, it's a red winged blackbird. And some birds just are really obvious in the way that, you know, we name them and what they look like and so forth. And for me, I think that red winged blackbirds for a lot of people in a lot of the country, it might be the first bird they see that really wows them when you see this male displaying and it's flaring everything out. And you almost, you know, you think like David Attenborough is gonna come out from the, the edge of the screen and start telling you something about this amazing thing that looks so tropical and odd that it couldn't be actually living here where I live, but they do. These amazing things are there for us to go and enjoy them. And all it takes is paying attention. A neighbor of mine the other day saw a red-winged blackbird and said, what are those birds? I've never seen anything quite like them. And you just realize that's the moment they started to pay attention because they've been there the whole time. Um, and, you know, the complexities are that, you know, the females look more like sparrows, the males are obvious, and they, you know, there, there are other aspects to this. So you start with the simplest stuff, and then later you move to the females, later you move to the immature birds as you get interested in this. Um, there is, for, you know, a lot of the Santa Cruz Mountains, at least the San Mateo County side, um, there's this site, you can go to San Mateo County Birding Guide, where every one of those little dots on the map, you can click on it, it opens up to tell you what birds are there, when to go, how to park, what the trails are, um, seasonal changes, and it's an incredible resource if you want to also know about what to look for in very specific sites that you might be wanting to visit. So these are all the top sites of San Mateo County, San Mateo County Birding Guide by Sequoia Audubon Society. Um, getting into the ecology of this, we have, um, as you know, our fog is really important in the Bay Area, very important to the Redwoods and Douglas Fir Forest. We have cold water out there that's creating the, the, the opportunity for this fog to condense and then flow in from the ocean to the coast and hit those mountain areas. The, that and thinking about the coast itself and the first sort of the, the flat areas near the coast as we go up the mountains, each one of these areas has a different aspect of habitat and different vegetation and also different birds. And you could almost like do a transect, which is what we're gonna do here from the coast up to the redwoods and just sort of show you a little bit about the birds that are found there. Um, this bird here, I put this specific one, the white crown sparrow, because our breeding population of white crown sparrows is very highly associated with the fog belt. So it's in chaparral and scrubby areas all along the coast, but you will also find it in Berkeley because Berkeley gets that fog line that comes out there in the summer and the right habitat, the right situation is, is there for breeding uh, white crown sparrows. So um, it's a very much a fog bird, if you ever had to sort of specifically, you know, think about fog and birds. We think of the forest and the connection to the ocean, often through the marbled merlet. This is the most clear cut situation of a bird that lives in the ocean and comes to breed in our old growth forests of Douglas firs and, and redwoods. Um, and these connections between the, the ocean and Habitat is are sometimes direct and sometimes indirect, but vital to understanding where birds are and also diversity and why this part of the world, specifically Central California, has so many species of birds and a lot of other things like plants and so forth, as compared to other areas in this latitude. So if we were to um, sort of choose, you know, look at what we're gonna sort of quickly sample. Um, here's Half Moon Bay, this is a map here on the coast, and we're gonna first look at a coastal terrace spot called Wavecrest. We're gonna go up here to Burley Murray, 
Ranch State Park and then Purissima Redwoods as a sort of little transect um, up the, um, the coastal slope. When you start at Waycrest, Waycrest is just on the southern edge of Half Moon Bay and it's a coastal uh, prairie, a probably a raised old, um, you know, this was probably under the, the ocean and the old shoreline was likely up here in the past and it was raised through activities, you know, tectonic activities and this flat area has a lot of grassland, some shrub and it's also some, you know, trees that people have put over the years where um, you can see a variety of raptors. It's very good for hawks and um, especially in winter. But thinking about the coast, we have western gulls and gulls are actually, um, we have a real diversity of gulls in, in our area. And for birders, gulls are really difficult because as soon as you start looking at the, the immatures and all the other migratory gulls, they can, they can get a little tough. But just think about our classic western gull on the coast, which is the one that's here all year round. And it, it's a good one to sort of think about because it never gets all dusky as an adult on the head. It just has this big white head and a banana on the head. That bill is always banana yellow. It never looks dark. It never looks dusky as an adult banana yellow bill. And I say it's a special goal because we tend to think of goals as sort of birds that are all over the place and they're super common and, and you know we don't pay attention to them much. But the western goal is almost, almost strictly a California endemic species. It it goes up into Washington State, Oregon. It kind of, you know, gets into a little bit of Mexico, but for the most part, most Western gulls in the world breed in California. And they are really, as far as gulls go, they don't have very much of a range and there's not that many of them worldwide. So we might ignore them if we don't know the context, but in knowing the context, they're actually quite a special bird. We have on the coast the pelicans that come in, especially during summer, and um, they're starting to come in right now, and they peak in the fall. They come from the south, and they are associated with this gull called the Hearman's gull, and also a bird called the elegant tern that I like to call the tres amigos, the three friends, because they all come down up from Mexico to be here during the really rich time of our ocean in that summer, early fall period, yet they breed mostly in Mexican waters. So think about the pelican that you might think that they're always around. They're actually migrants and these other birds come through with them looking for the same food sources. And as I mentioned, there are raptors out there on this coastal plain like Wavecrest. The most common in the Bay Area wide is the red-tailed hawk, but they don't always have a red tail. When they're young, they do not have a red tail. I'll give you a little tip. If you're looking for red-tailed hawks, they have these really broad wings and a broad tail, but they always have this dark area between the head and the crook of the wing. That dark area there is key. It's always there. So if you know that feature, you know you're looking at a red-tailed hawk if it has or doesn't have the red on the tail, which is an adult feature, right? So always sort of think about shape and sometimes features that are not the most obvious that the book might tell you, go look for this instead of the red tail because it's going to be more helpful along the way uh, as, you, as you, you know, look at different plumages. So we go a little higher up now. We're at Burley Murray Ranch State Park. This is an area that has chaparral on the slopes, a creek and riparian forest. I mean, sort of creekside forest of aspens and so forth, and also introduced species. As you can see here, there's a pine and there's some eucalyptus in the background. Um, and it's a very, very rich area for birds, and in particular, a lot of songbirds. So the little little birds and many migratory songbirds. There's also, in any, any time you're out there, you're enjoying the environment, you might see all sorts of other creatures from butterflies to this gray fox, for example. Burley Murray is actually a really great place to see a diversity of butterflies when it's sunny. Um, so it... Uh, Keep that in mind too. Those binoculars are useful for more than just birds. You can see all sorts of stuff with them. And um, one of the birds that might show up is the state bird, California quail. And this is sort of my entry into telling you that bird watching isn't all about watching. It's about listening. A lot of birds are found by hearing them. And you might want to start when you're starting to sort of think about them and, and learn them, 
and learn the vocalization, start with the easy ones. So here's one, and hopefully you'll hear the words Chicago that it says when it, it belts out its song. It's like Chicago, Chicago, Chicago. If you don't hear it, well, it's the, the number of syllables and it's kind of a simple song that you might hear in the forest, or not in the forest, but in, in the edge situations of Burley Murray that can tell you that a quail's there even though you don't see it because often they're more likely to be heard than seen. And a lot of birds are like this. There are birds that are residents that are there all year round, like the wren tit, that's this one over here. And then there's others that are migratory, like the orange crown warbler, which is a yellow bird that sometimes shows you the orange on the crown, sometimes it doesn't. Don't rely on the name to tell you the feature that, it, that you should look for. So actually look at the book to tell you what are the good features to, to look for and identifying. With, with orange crown, it's actually this, the fact that it looks kind of serious because it has this dark line through the eye and there's that little pale area above and below the eye. That's more useful than the orange crown. And um, these rentids are actually hard to see. You hear them much more often than, than you see them. So I'm going to play the voice. And I want you to listen for the fact that it's like a, like a ball that's falling. And each time it's making a shorter, shorter, shorter sound. And so you have this doot. Do, 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 and it goes into a trill. And then if you listen carefully, there's a second bird that actually comes in and just goes do, 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 do. Here, try it again. This, this bird is such a specific, um, it's a special bird of California that if you if you watch the old westerns and so forth, and they were shot on you know in sites in Southern California, you can hear wren tits almost always in those westerns playing in the background. Any any you know on on site outdoor um, shot that that was done in California tended to have wren tits in the background, and wren tits are hard to see as I mentioned. They're also a very odd group of birds. All most of their relatives are in Asia and Europe rather than here. And what for us being a resident, they're here all year round and they've actually, they keep the same pair bond throughout the year. And that song of one bird with the trill and the other one that doesn't have the trill, one is the male, one is the female. And they maintain their pair bond by actually singing together in a duet. And they do this throughout the year. So even in winter, you hear them duetting together. And it's very unusual to have that kind of behavior happen in a non-tropical situation. So California, again, is unusual in this respect. We have birds that act more like tropical birds, like these rentids. Um, I want to mention too that with migrants and residents and all this, birds make you pay attention to the day of the year, what season you're in. Do you start actually paying attention to what will happen soon once you understand when birds move in and when they move out? Um, right now, you know, there are warblers streaming through, the um, um, swallows have set up shop, and um, in particular in a place like Burley Murray, Wilson's warblers have arrived and they're singing up a storm right now, and that will lessen by June, and you won't hear them anymore by July. They'll be practically sort of shut down and they start changing their feathers before they, they migrate out in August, September. So some of these things are really ephemeral and you have to be paying attention to the time of year. And that means, again, you can return to the same place in different times of the year. And it's different because of the changes in the bird fauna and also the butterflies, everything else that's happening along the way. I mentioned the Wilson's Warbler. It's this beautiful kind of yellow bird with a little black yarmulke up on top. And it, it has this really sort of friendly look to its face. You know, it really sort of looks like an inviting, friendly guy, which is um, because its eye is sitting in this bright yellow face. That's partially why it gives you that impression. And when our birds leave, you know, we think of them as our birds. They're not our birds. They're the birds that actually could be in the backyards of people in Mexico. And then later on, some of them might be in Guatemala. Others go as far south as Chile. So birds are one of the few direct connections we have to other people in other habitats 
in other parts of the world. So think of every single migratory bird you see, it might go somewhere else at a different time of year where another person or another habitat is going to encounter that bird. And therefore, when we preserve habitat here for these birds to breed in or winter in, they are going to be using another habitat, another place, thanks to the fact that we are actually preserving those areas here. So think about that connection. A Swainson's thrush is one that's about to arrive at Burley Murray in just maybe in, in a week or two. They're, they'll be um, in there and they start, you know, they eat fruits and insects and they have a beautiful song. Let me play this for you. And the Swainson's thrush is related to the nightingales of of Europe. And if you go in the evening in particular, that's when they really sing up a storm. So a place that has Swainson's thrush is any riparian spot along the uh, uh, Santa Cruz mountains in about two, three weeks, um, go there right in the evening and all those birds will be singing all over the place. And it's pretty amazing. Um, patch, your patch, going, like I've mentioned this uh, several times, if you're getting into this, Find a place that you can return to multiple times where you get comfortable with what birds are there all the time and what birds and other things come in and out as the seasons change. And um, you will find you learn a lot by focusing on going to the same place over and over and over again, as opposed to sort of going to various different places where you know you don't you can't make those connections between habitat, birds, song migration as you can when you just sort of concentrate on a spot or two. So that's another thing if you're starting. Try to find yourself a patch. Um, as you learn, you'll find out that, you know, the birds that you've been calling blue jays forever, actually not blue jays or California scrub jays or stellar's jays, and they like different habitats. Stellar's jays like deeper, darker forests. And in fact, if you get into redwoods, you will see stellar's jays while in oaks and more open habitats, you'll see the scrub jays or chaparral. And um, that gets us a little further up, finally to the redwoods. And like here in this case, Purissima. And I have to say that once you're in the redwoods, it's harder to visually find birds because you are in a situation where a lot of things are way up top. So um, think about listening for birds and also seeing what birds do show up that, that are unique or most um, common in redwoods as opposed to other, other places. One little bird is this guy here that almost doesn't look like a bird. It's called the brown creeper. And uh, it looks like a little bit of bark. And what it does is it creeps up each um, tree trunk and goes up to a certain height, then flies down lower on the next tree and it goes up and almost like a woodpecker, but it's a tiny, tiny little guy. And once you kind of focus in and see them, they're really a, a bird that I find sort of, to me says redwoods, at least locally. In, in the breeding season, if you hear a buzzy song from way up top of the trees, it could be this beautiful hermit warbler with the yellow head. And it gets replaced by its close relative, the Townsend's warbler with a mask on its face in winter. So Townsend's are here in winter, hermits are here in summer very closely related, and they both are specialists of conifer forests. So the Townsend's, when it leaves, it goes all the way up to British Columbia, Alaska, and it's in a different series of um, coniferous forests up there, while the hermit um, will be here as a breeder, then it takes off in the winter. Um, and in terms of listening for birds in the, in the redwoods, one of the birds that for me is the bird that attracts my attention when I'm in redwood forest is the little Pacific wren. And this guy is the Pacific wren, a little brown thing, with a little stand-up tail related to a backyard species called the Buick's wren that's got a longer tail and a stripe through the eye and above the eye. But the Pacific wren has to be in forest and it has to be in really shady, moist forest, often right by a stream or a little water trickle, right? But listen to this.
the, the I would call them acoustic gymnastics that that little bird has to make to make all of those sounds so quickly and elaborately. I mean, it is, it is incredible what this little tiny bird does. And it's actually a very loud song. And it's not just one song that it has, it has multiple different versions of a song. Like I think it goes up to 15 to 20 different song versions that any one male Pacific Wren will have. And you hear it all the time and it's not necessarily a bird you'll, you'll sort of see easily, but once you hear it, you'll start thing oh yeah like that is actually quite a song and a half for a little bird and eventually you'll you'll see them they they do pop up but um look for them once you've heard them you'll be able to sort of see where they're calling from um the habitat matters in an interesting way for some birds like um for song sparrows are all over the bay area but in winter we have migratory song sparrows that come in from places that are moist and forested and those dark looking song sparrows actually end up in the edge of redwood forest. You don't see these dark ones anywhere else. So keep um, thought on sort of the uh, potential for very specific habitat issues to be involved. I think this is kind of cool that a bird from the dark moist areas chooses to come here to our dark moist areas and doesn't take the habitat the other song sparrows take. And finally, bird identification. You know, there are downy woodpeckers, hairy woodpeckers, and downy is this little short billed thing, hairy woodpeckers, a long bill, they look very similar. There's the crow and the raven. The crow's got a shorter bill, the raven has a longer bill, the raven has more of a sort of uh, scraggly throat pattern. The raven can sometimes look just long winged and massive and huge bill that can sort of cause damage. The crow, much less interesting looking, but similar in that it's black like a raven. And when you make these identifications of difficult birds, when you're trying to learn how to tell a raven from a crow or a hairy from a downy woodpecker, there's an element of focus and thought and just you watching that bird and trying to put things into perspective that truly is kind of a mindful moment. Um, it, you, you have to be sort of just thinking about that for a while and nothing else. And there's, uh, people say, why, why are, are folks so interested in bird identification? Often it's the puzzle aspect of you are just focused on one thing for a little bit, for a few seconds, for a minute, and you don't think about other things. And there's a, um, an element of joy once you figure out what it is and you, hopefully you're right. And also of calmness in that you are at that moment, you, the bird, time stops still. And that is something that also I think is such an amazing part of watching birds. So just remember to keep it fun. Sometimes it can get tough. You don't wanna be looking at the really difficult things early on in your birding sort of um, adventures. You can always roll it back and look at something colorful and more obvious like a spotted towhee. Always make sure that you never get to the level where you're truly frustrated. Sort of bring it back to the point where it's enjoyable because you always learn more when you're having fun with it. So I hope that's been a nice introduction for you folks to birding and just uh, bring birds into your life. It's gonna make your hiking, other aspects of your nature enjoyment, I think even better. So thank you folks. Thank you. Me, yeah. There we go. Um, that was great. And you're making me want to get back outside and um, check out some birds. All I right. wonder if you could take a minute and tell us how you got started. Oh, well, birding. I got started, you know, a lot of people talk about a spark bird. So that red winged blackbird for a lot of people, it's like, oh, wow, look at that, you know, right. and it's they, they say, I did not have a spark bird at all. I had a moment of boredom as a kid, as a as a 11 year old, where I was up in Canada, uh, where I grew up, and, and I didn't know what to do. I was bored. And I saw that this place had a binoculars and a bird book. And I took them out in the canoe, you know, classic Canadian kind of thing to do out in the canoe. And, and I got hooked on the fact that you could look at these birds and this book, and then find out like for me it was something magic that no other kid knew 
you know, it was sort of like, oh boy, you know, I know stuff that other kids don't know. And it was like a secret world and they, until I found other kids that were into it too. And that, uh, that really got me going. <laughs> That's great. I, I have two younger kids and I know, because I try to get them out birding, I like birding. And, um, you know, you're competing with um, a lot of distractions from screen time. And, you know, a lot of people now experience nature increasingly through a screen. And I just wonder how you've seen birding change in the time that you've been involved. Well, I think there's there's an, uh, the flip side of it too is that you now have um, apps, you know, like eBird and Merlin and other things that are out there that a lot of younger people gravitate to because they can put their bird sightings into this thing or have Merlin help them identify stuff. And it's a little bit like the screen suddenly gets them outdoors. Yeah, it's almost like the the you know, Pokemon Go phenomenon where people were chasing around these fake things that popped up. <laughs> well, yeah. we can chase, out, chase around real things <laughs> that are out right. there, whether it's butterflies or birds. And it's the same feeling of, you know, um, you, you're collecting things in a sense and some things are rarer than others. So you, you look through and go, wow, I wonder where I can see this Western tanager. And then suddenly, boom, there it is. And you think, <gasps> You know, that's so exciting to sort of know something exists and suddenly see it for the first time. Are you seeing uh, increases in the number of people birding or other changes in who's birding? Yeah, I think there are more people birding than ever. Uh, the pandemic actually increased the interest um, in birding overall. And there are more, there are younger people overall, at least in the US and Canada, because some other countries actually have always had young people birding. But in North America in particular, it's always been an, I don't wanna say, it's like 50 and up, you know? Yeah. It's always been the, 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 the group. And now there's younger people involved. I can see that it's changing. More people, I think, um, people don't realize that most birders in North America are women. Actually, there's, I would say 60% of the birders probably are women. So, the, and that's been for a long time. But the, the, the sort of people that, that are the movers and shakers in the birding world tend to be men. And there's an element, I think, that that's starting to change too. Um, and um, I do think that there's a real conversation that a lot of people are having about getting people uh, from all sorts of backgrounds, you know, I'm, I'm Latino, I'm Chilean, or, you know, I was born in Chile, so um, different backgrounds involved in this too, and I think the only way we can do this is from having folks see somebody that kind of looks like them out there in the field, whether it's yeah. hiking, birding, whatever, yeah. Yeah, well, you know, there's, I think, some um, awareness raising that happened in the last couple of years as there's been discussion around um, some high profile incidents. The gentleman in Central Park, African American guy who was challenged, uh, I think just because he was black for being out, you know, looking at birds. And so there's been discussions about birding while black and it's not just black folks. It's, I think, um, I think a number of uh, groups have mentioned that they don't feel safe or don't feel like it's inclusive. So it's, that makes me feel good if you think that's starting to change. I, I think it's, it's starting to change and, and we have um, the Bay Area is probably a, a different place than a lot of other parts of North America in terms of how um, inclusive they are um, for people. I do think that um, an element I'm telling people to go out there, watch birds, um, have fun. And I'm, I'm this tall, you know, male. And, and, yeah. and I, for the most part, feel comfortable walking around in, in forest trails by myself. Uh, if you don't feel comfortable, go with friends. I mean, form a group. I think that's primarily one of the things we, we need to worry about here is just general safety. And it's not just safety from people but you could you know you um you could get lost too there i mean i i, I don't ever go places too far away by myself i kind of try yeah. to keep uh, so i think safety in other respects is also something we need to think about but 
I don't want to discourage anybody. It's just the benefits of being outside. There's so much, so many benefits that, I mean, I, I, I've been a birder forever. I, a few years ago, I lost my hearing in one ear, like almost overnight to a virus. Hmm. And that was tough. And I got to say the birds were the, the nature what was where I was able to sort of work through all of this more than any other thing. It's like where I was like, okay, you know, life's going to go on and be great nonetheless, because look, everything else is still great out here. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, just listening to those bird songs you were playing, I could feel my, my stress level, you know, just, just a notch going yeah. down. And yeah. we, one of our recent webinars was about this idea of forest bathing, which is a very similar um, concept. So um, definitely a consistent theme for this audience. Well, right. Switching gears a bit from sort of the birding experience and who's birding, I wanted to ask you some questions about how you think the health of our bird populations in this region are doing. This audience has heard a lot about wildfire and drought. There's a very high level of awareness of climate change and the impacts that may be having on fog patterns, etc. And I just wondered what you're seeing. You've been here in this region for a while. You operate across the landscape. How are you, what are you observing about the impacts that it's having on bird species? Um, I think there's always winners and losers in any environmental habitat change. So yeah. with the fires, for example, there will be as as that the place recuperates and we have these standing trees that are dead there are a lot of woodpeckers that are going to do well the uh scrub underneath in more open situations you can sort of see okay wren tits are going to move in there or maybe song sparrows yeah. but we're going to not have winter wren i mean no i'm using the old name pacific wrens uh necessarily as commonly only in the moist area so there's an element of okay some of that hopefully will recuperate. I worry about the fact that we might not get the forest back the way it was, right? Yeah. That, that yeah. it may be too warm, that it might be yeah. oaks will encroach. And sure, there's birds nature that love the oaks, and, but it's not what we used to have. So yeah. there's a worry longer term. Um, there are, you know, iconic species that are becoming more common. Bald eagles are becoming more common in the Bay Area. And you think like, what? Bald eagle is a big deal. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, peregrine falcons that, you know, we nearly lost to DDT or brown pelicans. They've all sort of rebounded. Yeah. But little birds, some of the little birds that might be affected by pesticide use and um, in, especially insectivores, birds that eat insects have been going into declines throughout North America. And I do think that when we, if we have the chance to buy products that are pesticide free, it's not just about your health in, you know, what you're eating, but the general benefits that this may have across the landscape that might be even bigger than anything yeah. directly. So obviously it's more expensive. Yeah. Yeah, but you know, so there's things like that that I think about. So pesticides yeah. are a worry. You mentioned that when we were preparing this for this, for this webinar, you mentioned to me that issue about insect populations. And I've been reading about the decline, but I hadn't, I don't know why I should have, but I didn't put two and two together with it impacting bird species. So, you know, I'm yeah. thinking about, are there enough full growth trees, which of course is also a consideration, but that was a really sobering conversation for me to hear you talk yeah. about. Um, because we know insect populations are declining. There's lots of stories about, I mean, in particular bees and, but, but in general, um, right. Right. decline of the monarchs, just these high profile species that are really indicators for a lot of other probably lesser known species that are, yeah. that are suffering um, or struggling. So, uh, well, how, um, how are you feeling about uh, sort of bird populations at a more macro level? Are you similarly sort of, maybe not sanguine is the wrong word, but feeling like, you know, some are gonna pop up more here and others are gonna pop up more there and they may be shifting, but you don't have sort of an alarmist reaction to declines overall? Or do you think that bird lovers of the world do indeed need to be really concerned at uh, well, I, sort of I net think... decline that's happening? I think we need to be concerned. Um, it, 
overall. I do think that, like I said, there's always winners and losers, but I, I spend a lot of time thinking about the marine environment and going yeah. offshore. And, and to me, um, some of the things that have happened it, in the last while, when we had the, what they, they called the warm water blob, maybe uh, yeah. 2017. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that level of change that happened in a two or three year yeah. you know, period that it went away, you know, it's kind of crept back in, but it would have been, I always told people that if you understood what that meant in the ocean compared to the land, it would have been like, if you were suddenly like, you know, here in the Bay Area, you open your window in the backyard and suddenly, you know, there's road runners and birds from the Mexican desert all running around. And yeah. you're thinking, what happened? Everything moved yeah. hundreds yeah. of miles north. Yeah. And that's what happened in our ocean system for, for a few years. And that was really scary because that was huge. Yeah. Yeah. And I do worry about those things in the ocean that are not necessarily so tangible for us. Yeah. That might be sort of a canary in the coal mine to all sorts of other things that will happen um, here. And you mentioned fog. Fog yeah. is a big one, right? So if we have a warmer ocean, we're going to have less fog. Yeah. And if we have less fog, we have less. <laughs> it just we have goes... a lot of things that are impacted. <laughs> yeah. Vegetation, species, people, everything. Right. Uh, agriculture. Yeah. All right. Well, I know I could ask you a gazillion questions. <laughs> I'm going to ask one more and then I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, um, Matt, who's been monitoring the chat to see what kind of questions yeah. we've gotten there I, so that we can include our audience questions. I should I should say one thing, though. I think we always have to act. No, we always I, I like to always act from a point of optimism because to to be completely pessimistic about the world it, it doesn't actually cause you to feel like you have the energy to work on a solution so yeah you know so that's why I kind of well you know <laughs> well and I think there are endless examples of nature's resilience yeah it may not be what it was or what it is now but there's endless examples mm -hmm. of um nature surviving in its own ways <laughs> maybe in different places right. maybe in different assemblages of natural communities um and in the bird world, you alluded to some of the greatest conservation success stories in my lifetime, you know, bald eagles, osprey, California condor increasingly being reintroduced after near extinction. Um, yeah. All right. I yeah. lied. I have two questions I'm going to ask you. So one <laughs> of the one of the extinction questions that I, I wasn't going to ask because it's outside this region, but I have to ask, I just read yet another article suggesting that the ivory-billed woodpecker may not actually be extinct, that yeah. there's some little, you know, uh, hardwood isolated forest in Louisiana now they're saying where they may have been discovered and this crops up every, I don't know, five or 10 years and people like me get their hopes up. So do you know any, do you know anything? Uh, well, I, we, we actually, with some friends, we have a podcast called Life List, a mm -hmm. birding podcast. And today we, we, we put out our new one, which is about partially about this topic, and said we're all so hopeful, but the 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 proof so far from these you know these uh, photographs are so so scant and yeah dubious in that you can't I, do I see that do I not see it that do I just want to see it do I just want to see it that we we want it to be true, but we cannot let ourselves go there. I think until we have the real undeniable kind of info. Yeah. And I know some people might say, well, that's kind of, you know, it, it's good that they're looking. So yes, it's good that people are looking and, but we have a lot of conservation problems that are yeah. real, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that are happening, that need our attention. So that will be a major story and a lot of money would have to be invested to get yeah. them. So so I, I do feel like it's it's vital to have really good you know proof yeah yeah and i don't see it yet unfortunately yeah. all right all right my last question and then i will yield to matt is um you alluded to this but i just wanted to put a little point finer point on it this region is incredibly diverse in a lot yeah. of ways ecologically and you mentioned the diversity of birds in our area but i don't know and our audience loves this region but i don't know that even they fully understand how extraordinary it is in terms of its richness and how fortunate we are. And I just wondered, 
if you could just take a moment and help them understand, you know, within yeah. the larger, say, U.S. or even the larger state of California, just yeah. how special this place is. So I think if you just boil it down to the fact that we're in a Mediterranean climate region, so we have dry summers, you know, cool, wet winters, that only occurs in handful places on Earth. Yeah. And that means that we have sort of little desert avifauna next to us. We have sort of a, um, a wet forest um, situation as well. And that creeps in due to the fact that we have the mountains creating the moist areas so that forest can drop in. And we have the dry areas on the other side of the mountains that allow almost that semi-desert to, to roll in. So then you have so many habitats in one area, a lot of them with endemic, species, plants, insects, that California, and specifically this sort of section of California, is one of the richest, most endemic, rich places in the temperate world. I mean, really, it's, it's major. If you have, you know, you ask people, how many states have a bird that is only found within that state? Well, California has more than one, actually. <laughs> so yellow-billed magpie and, you know, island scrub jays. Um, and there are other things that are nearly endemic to the state, and in particular, most common in the central part. So yeah, we are in an amazing, if you're going to start watching birds, you pick the right spot. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so. Well, and if you're going to invest in conservation, yeah. this is a great place to do it, not only because yeah. you can um, right. see amazing trees and get out and enjoy your own backyard, but you're also benefiting a larger um, right. diversity of species. So. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Well, I'm going to turn it over to Matt, who's probably irritated because I've taken up most of our Q&A time, but I was just so interested. Thank you. Thank you. Matt, what questions do you have for us? You've asked some of uh, the ones from the Q&A, so thank you. Um, uh, let me jump in with a question about changes. Um, uh, we've talked a little bit about climate, and, and we've talked about uh, climate, you know, how climate's affecting things and the fire's affecting things. Are you seeing any disturbances or new uh, migration patterns um, that are alarming or interesting to you in the region? Um, yeah, there, there's sort of a, some of, you know, some birds are, have been moving northward, some ocean birds. Um, we have had elegant turns starting the nest in the Bay Area as of a few years ago. We've had boobies that are tropical species, now are regular offshore. We um, are seeing some species that are definitely tracking a change in environment. And then there are others that, that are kind of um, pileated woodpeckers seem to be reacting to the fact that we're not chopping down as many old dead trees. We're leaving dead wood yeah. in, in the environment and they're becoming slightly more common. They're, they're sort of moving in and so I see that as a positive habitat change that's happened. So it's kind of all over the place. There's some things that are, and, and birders always love new things, even sometimes they're for the wrong reasons, right? So like, oh, you know, we have these terns nesting here, but it's because the ocean's probably warming. Um, so there are multiple changes. There are other species that seem to have declined where you hardly see them anymore, the loggerhead shrike used to be a wintering species here on the coast. That was not that hard to find. Now I'll, I might see one a winter mm. and it's disappeared uh, and it likes bigger insects uh, in terms of its breeding, you know, larger insects are what it eats. So it's particularly prone to anything to do with, with um, insect populations, I think, in its breeding. So yeah, this, it's all over the place, but things are, you can see things happening, definitely. Thank you. Um, that answered a lot of questions at once too, <laughs> which is great, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask a little uh, question about your journey. Um, is there something in, in your world, in your profession that you don't know enough about that you're, you're hoping to get to learn more about as you, as you grow in your expertise? Well, I, I think the greatest thing is I've always thought that um, you know, the, the, the element of discovery is one of the most awesome sort of things that can happen to you as a, 
as a human and discovery in various ways. But the idea that that people at one point didn't know much about the world and they, you know, found out more and were sort of in this discovery phase. And I, I thought as I would get older, that would sort of tamp down because so much more would be known. But it seems like every question asks two or three more new questions. And I, I love the fact that I am going to leave this world at some point with more questions than I started with. So I think that's actually for me really, you know, I, I like that idea that I don't know it all. I won't ever know it all. And every day I learn something new and that keeps it interesting for me. So. I love that attitude. <laughs> I think that's a great attitude and a great <laughs> approach to, well, not just conservation, all things in life. Um, well, we have run out of time. Thank you so much. This was really fun, really interesting. We're going to put your website up, I believe, at the end of this and have it on our website for folks who might be interested in learning more about the, the birding adventure trips that you lead. Um, I suspect you may have some more takers. And um, just thank you for sharing your, your world with us and your perspective. It's really, really been fun. Um, and to our audience, thank you for joining us. Thank you again to um, Tarf Investments for sponsoring this series. And um, our speaker for next month, which we hope you will join us for, is Lenya Quinn Davidson, who's going to be joining us to talk about uh, fire policy, wildfire policy, and what are some of the barriers and what are some of the opportunities to see more prescribed fire happen in our region to help support some of these bird species. So thank you again, um, Alvaro, and thank you to our audience for joining us. We'll thank see you. you next month for the next Under the Redwoods webinar. <laughs>